I realized this weekend that I was old. My granddaughter turned 14. And I thought, man, kids are supposed to be 14, not grandkids. And so I remember when I started something way back with a raisin board, I had Jim Anderson come on, and, and he had a, a grandchild that was 16. I thought, man, you're old. <laughs> and now I am there. So this whole idea of vitamin D, I, I've never really thought about these nutrients for viral infections. And on this, really, I'm just going to talk about COVID because it's the one of the day. And I want to spend my time doing that. We're going to talk about these four. Up until COVID, I thought vitamin D was involved with bones, which it is. But I didn't know it was anything past that. When I started hearing the stuff about vitamin D and infections, I thought, no, that's not true. I, and so I started looking at it as soon as it happened, 2020 March. And I started looking at all this data. And I came up with some talks. And I've been giving this. It's the one I think is most important for me right now is to talk about nutrients. Because people say there is no cure for COVID, but there really is. Uh, there's nothing to prevent COVID. Well, there really is. Not 100%. You know, you can't get rid of it all the time. But boy, if this body that's fearfully and wonderfully made, you just give it the right materials, it's incredible what it can do. And COVID is, is no uh, exception. All right, so vitamin D, vitamin D and COVID prevention and treatment. This is what I found. I'd been studying about vitamin D for a year. And then the NIH said, we have information for you. And this is uh, April 21, 2021. And I, and I read their stuff and I went, what? Now, here's the interesting part of this. All of my heroes have been wiped out, the people I trusted. I always trusted the NIH. They will give me the right information, and they didn't. Look at this. See this web page? It was updated April 2021. Well, I called it up last week, April 8, 9, 2022. They have one year and four month old information on the website right now. If you want to know from the NIH, what do I do with vitamin D, you'll come to this. And this says there's insufficient evidence to recommend either for or against the use of vitamin D for prevention or treatment of COVID. It wasn't true when it was written a year and a half ago, and it's really not true now, but they haven't updated it. It was a hard thing for me when I saw this, because I've always tell my students, if it says .gov, it's right. You can trust it. And now I say, if it says .gov, you got to test it like everything else that you read, because it just, it just isn't uh, the solid information that it used to be. In this little thing that they have on the, on the web, uh, they say you can't use it for prevention or treatment. They quote one study, one study. This, their article has 12 references. Only one reference is in the last three years, which is this study. I thought, isn't that odd that they found one study and said, we don't know. Well, so I decided to look at this study. This study is by Murray. And so what did Murray do? He took a double-blind, placebo-controlled study, good, 240 hospital patients, good, gave them one dose of 200,000 international units. OK, but one dose, too late, is not so good. Conclusion, there's no significant difference between the two arms. Well, was their study good? They randomized the, the people 10.3 days after symptoms, so that's more than two weeks since they got the disease. So you're dealing with a group of people that have had COVID for two weeks. So what does vitamin D do? And would you expect it to do anything after 14, 15, 16 days? And most of the people in their study were vitamin D sufficient. <laughs> they had enough vitamin D anyway. And I think, man, one study. And then they say, if you want to study more on this, instead of them doing it themselves, they said, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov, which is a massive website of tens of thousands of studies, some going, some not going, some done. And, and instead of doing it themselves, they said, you do it. Go take a look at it. So I wanted to see how much info. I had it all. I mean, I, I probably had 100 articles. So I want to show you a little bit about what we had even back then. This is another clinical trial by Restogi. And it's a randomized placebo-controlled trial also. And what they did is they had 60,000 international units um, they tried to get people up to 50 nanograms per milliliter, and they randomized 16 in the intervention, 24 in the control, and 10 of the 16 patients actually got up to 50 nanograms per milliliter. And uh, in two more days, two more of them got to that level. 
So they were able to get most people up with one big shot of 60,000 international units. Now this is their research. So this is what Rostogi did. This is vitamin D events. So there were 10 of the 16 people cleared COVID in a week, 10 of 16, in the vitamin D group. In the placebo group, it was only five of 24 cleared COVID in a week. Well, that's kind of important, don't you think? That would be good information to give, and it was significant uh, difference, and so it favored vitamin D. And I thought, well, why didn't they talk about this study when the NIH brought up the information? And they also looked at fibrinogen in patients with COVID. And so fibrinogen dropped 0.3 in the placebo and 1.3 in the vitamin D, significant 0.0004. Hmm, interesting. Here's another, Castillo, this was another trial that had already been done before April 2021. And this is what they did, a parallel uh, study. They had 76 consecutive patients. On the day of admission, they got 20,000. And, and then uh, the treatment group got 10,000 on day three, seven, and every week until they left. That's a good design too. And so what did Rostogi find here? Rostogi found without any calcifediol treatment, half of the people ended up in the ICU, 13 out of 50. In the vitamin D treatment, only one out of 50, 2%. Instead of 50%, 2%, and that was very significant too. Why, why I just, it's beyond me why the NIH didn't look at this study that they had. This told me as soon as I saw it, and I knew this before I had seen the NIH data, this looks like it really, really works. It's, it's good data. So of the 13 patients who went to I, two died. Well, that's, and nobody died in the vitamin D group, and only one of them went to the emergency, to, to the ICU. Now, this is, this is a high dose of calcifediol. What is calcifediol? When you're in the sun, the sun hits your skin, and it turns 7-dehydrocholesterol into cholecalciferol. That's vitamin D. But that doesn't do anything. You can, you can get it from the sun, or you can eat it. But it has to go to your liver to be changed to calcidiol or calcifediol. That's the first step. So what they gave these people was not vitamin D. They gave them the first metabolite so that they're even more likely to get the true vitamin D quickly. And it seemed to work extensively well. And then eventually this turns into calcitriol, which is the thing that's actually active in your body. All right. And so now I'm going to go back to April 2nd. This is two weeks after the president said, we have a problem here. I didn't think there was a problem. I was traveling in Idaho in March, and I was giving talks throughout the Northwest, and then all of a sudden COVID's over there somewhere, and then the president says, pandemic. Really? And everything quit. All my every flights, everything ended. So this is what um, Bill Grant said back then. Uh, to reduce the risk of infection, take 10,000 international units of vitamin D uh, for a few weeks each day to build up your blood levels. Randomized control trials need to be done. But he said that in the very beginning. And so this is April 2nd, and, and the NIH came out right after that and said, nah, we don't know anything. So everybody looked at that and thought, well, we don't know. Well, now you can see some of what we knew. And then here's some more. So this is in September. This is a retrospective observational study, 190,000 patients from all 50 states. And it was done through mid-March, right when it began, through June 2020. And they found out that the positivity rate was directly correlated to the deficiency rate of vitamin D. Less than 20 nanograms per milliliter uh, were more than in the adequate values of 30 to 40. So to give you a perspective, right now, you go to your doctor, you get your vitamin D done, 30 is what is considered sufficient and 20 to 30 is insufficient, less than 20 is deficient. So these are deficient people here. And uh, it was significantly different. And so this is what they had. This is a, a very interesting graphic. So what it shows is, here's 20, I told you that's deficient. You can be down here at 10. Most older people are down in this range. And so here is SARS-CoV positivity rate, seven, nine, 11, 13. You can imagine if you went from here to hear what you might find, as you would expect. It is extremely high rate. So look at this coming down. This is what 30 is what we've said is sufficient. This is enough to stop you from getting rickets. 
If you want your bones not to bend, you need this much. But now we're finding, look at this, it looks like it's, it's even more protective to 40, and, and it keeps going down to 50, and it keeps going down to 60. Most people now say 40 to 60. I had mine taken, um, just a regular blood test about a month ago, and mine was 73, which is a good level. Now, my wife went in, and, and hers was, was 24. And we started giving her supplements, and she bumped it up to 28. What? So we had to give her even more, and she finally got it up here to about 20, upper 20s, almost 30. So number one thing I can say, and everybody, we all think that the thing we study is most important, and everybody else is not as important as ours. You get that, you get that idea when you start studying things. But I really do think that this could be the most important thing we can do during this time of COVID and viral infections to make sure our vitamin D is high enough. And then this is March 29th, so this is looking at vitamin D levels associated with susceptibility and severity, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Wow. And so here we are. This is looking at vitamin uh, COVID infection rate, just the rate of infection. And we have a number of studies here, and we can look at it. Uh, you're five times more likely, four times more likely, 1.5 times, an average of 2.7 times more likely to get infected with COVID if your vitamin D is low. Now this is looking at severity. So it, we don't get it, but how bad is it once we get it? Uh, once again, it's, it's four times less if you have enough vitamin D, 1.1 time. The average is 2.1. You're twice as likely to have severe COVID if your vitamin D is low. That's kind of amazing. And then of all things, a good endpoint to look at in any study is death, because that's kind of final. And so it's, it's the main thing, you know, we don't want to die. And so, well, what about death then? You can see this, the average three. You're three times more likely to um, die if your vitamin D level is low. And so that is what, that is a small percentage. That's five, maybe 10% of all the data I had in April last year. And the NIH sampling, I just showed you all the things they had up until that time. And there's a whole lot more now. PubMed, I just type in vitamin D and COVID, there's 1,291 publications. If I look just at 2020, there's 364. There's lots of data. And people say it's just, it's just associational, observational data. Because when you observe something happening, you can't determine what caused it. So we do clinical trials where everything's held the same. We change one thing with vitamin D. And then if there's a difference, it was the vitamin D. So there are clinical trials. I've showed you three of them. NIH should have said, if vitamin D levels are low in the general population, give them supplements, whether there's COVID or not. I mean, that's just a smart thing. If you find people are extremely low, there's four nutrients for the past 15 years our government has been worried about. Uh, and, and these, vitamin D is one of them, of the four that America is low in. So, why wouldn't you just say that? And if people that have COVID, there's enough data there, observational data, that we should have at that time said, if you're low in vitamin D for COVID patients, give them a supplement. It has finally happened where people are getting this, but it's taken a long time. And I would have said, this is me, what I would have said, the data on the treatment of vitamin D looks very promising. Vitamin D should be used as an adjunct to whatever you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing, but do this too. Randomized controlled trials are needed to confirm treatment efficacy. That should have been said back then. So my question to you is, if you don't know what your vitamin D level is, you should know. I went to so many doctors. I went to the local hospitals near me that I work with, and I went to the emergency rooms, and I went to the COVID areas, and I talked to a doctor. I said, you know, here's all, and I gave him a, a, a list of, I don't know, maybe 100 studies, and I said, look at all of these. Uh, we need to start giving vitamin D. And he said, I have been treating these patients. I know what I'm doing. And I wanted to say how many of them lived. Two of my friends died right here in your hospital. You know? But he was very confident and said, no, no, I don't need anything else. Uh, we're doing fine. We don't need vitamin D. And I went, I, and I, many doctors I talked to, too, and I couldn't get any of them to take it and say, yeah, I think we ought to just give them vitamin D supplements. It was like chipping through concrete. So here's just a few more on this. This is looking at 5,000 compared to 1,000. Huh. People say, I take 1,000 international units. 1,000 international units was high 10 years ago. It is not high now. 
And we, I gave that to my wife for six months, and it didn't do anything. Uh, we had to give her five, and I think I gave her 10 to get hers up into the normal range. This is just looking at cough, and this is looking at cumulative recovery. As you go along, these are the recovery rates. And so this is 5,000, this is 1,000. You can see that cough cleared much faster with 5,000 with 1,000. Okay, it's not a death sentence, but it's nice not to be coughing. Did any of you have a friend that had COVID that couldn't stop coughing continuously? Anybody? That was a horrible thing. You can't sleep, you can't do anything because you're just always coughing. And then here's agusia. What's that? You can't taste. Well, when you eat food, is it nicer to taste it or not? <laughs> it's better to taste it while you're eating it. And so all this shows is, uh, this is five, ten days. You can see that generally the ones taking five cleared up about five days before the others. Okay, it's not a big deal, but it's nice to be able to taste. And then vitamin D, a review of uh, preventing and reducing severe COVID infection. I just want to show you this one diagram. In your body, you all know that antioxidants are important, right? Right? Antioxidants, you get them from fruits and vegetables. You know your body makes it? Really? Yeah, it makes a couple very important ones. It makes this one, uh, superoxide dismutase, SOD. It takes these free radicals that are just chewing up your body, and it detoxifies them down to hydrogen peroxide. Still kind of toxic, but it, it gets them down. And then glutathione peroxidase takes that and turns it into water. Isn't that wonderful? But we have to make the glutathione. There's things that we can do to help our body make it, and you then have this glutathione that's not working. You need to regenerate it, and glutathione reductase regenerates the glutathione so that it works. And lo and behold, vitamin D upregulates glutathione reductase. Isn't that amazing? Those are the two chemicals that keep you from dying on a daily basis. Because all of these free radicals going around, we hear about, we, we eat antioxidants. But these are the two that we make that keep us healthy. Um, <laughs> when you have a car and it gets oxygenized, it rusts. You take an apple and you cut it and it turns brown. You, you basically rust and turn brown on the inside. <laughs> and, and so this is what keeps you from rusting and turning brown on the inside. And then this is low vitamin D levels, a strong independent predictor of mortality and hospitalizations in severe patients. So this compares everything that you know. So the first one is, yeah, the older you are, the worse it is. Yeah, your hazard ratio is, is 1.4. And so you can see it right there. And then male sex, it's a bummer to be male, really, uh, because you're more likely, uh, 1.4. Uh, have you heard that overweight is associated with uh, COVID and COVID deaths? It really is 1.2. You're 1.2 times more likely if you have a high BMI. Diabetes, 1.1. How much have we heard about diabetes? Oh, if you have diabetes, danger, danger. Look at that. It's a little bit more, but not much. And then here is vitamin D low levels less than 12.5. That's the real sufficient one uh, uh, that I was talking about, that it, you're really not getting enough. And look at it. Look at it. It is 1.46. It's up here with all the big boys as far as the things that we're worried about. <laughs> Weight, diabetes, all those things. Vitamin D, and you know what? Hmm. It's easier to take a tiny vitamin D pill than it is to lose 50 pounds. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Of all things we can do, just take a vitamin D. And then this one is, is an interesting one. This is hospitalized older patients who pre-hospital took vitamin D. Wow, what? Wait, this is a very loose study. What if you just took vitamin D as a supplement, or you didn't take vitamin D as a supplement, and how did you fare? And what this is showing is that here's the pre-hospital vitamin D supplementation, yes. So these people took it, and uh, severity of COVID, uh, 19, and then here's the ones who didn't take it, 86. Significantly different, 0 0.001. How about ICU admission? Uh, here, there are 10 that took just, just took vitamin D in any sort as a supplement before you got COVID. Um, then ICU admission, 10 out of 56. And then here, the ones that didn't, 74 out of, out of 88, significant at 0 0.001. 
just those that took a, some vitamin D before they got COVID, it seemed to make a difference and it was very significant. So where do we stand, America, in our vitamin D status? This is looking at, uh, these numbers are different now. This is millimoles per liter. We've been talking about nanograms. So we've been talking about 20 is really, really low. And 50 millimoles per liter equals that. So here's 50 millimoles per liter. So that's showing in the total population, basically, on average, we're all very, very low. Just on average. You look at, at males, uh, they're worse than females. Between uh, Mexican-American, uh, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white, there's differences. And I think this has to do with skin color. You make vitamin D only when the sun gets through your skin into your dermal layer, and it makes vitamin D. So the darker you are, the more sunlight you need. And then this is older people, like me, over 60. This is less than 30, that's not sufficient. And look at it, it's about uh, 80 to 90%. 80 to 90% of older adults are not sufficient in vitamin D. And now remember I said not 30 is not what we're after now. Almost everybody's saying 40 to 60. If you get to 100, that's not so good. And if you get to 150, you better watch out. You might kill yourself. And so you can always overdo everything. We, I thought we could overdo this really easy. It's really hard. But you can with high supplements. And so you've really got to be careful not to over supplement. So the best thing to do is know where you are. Here's less than 20. That is really deficient. And it's about 50% of the population. Here's less than 11. I'm surprised people have bones in this country. Because this is the level where you get rickets. I'm surprised we're not all walking around like this because our bones are all messed up. But that's a good 10 to 20% of the population is way down here. I want to show you this. You can't read the details of it, but I want to show you because of the color. This is a meta-analysis. If you want to look at this, you can, uh, well, it doesn't say it. I cut off the top. Uh, but it's actually C19 med meta, and I'll show you that later. But this is all the studies have been done. And you can see here that the green, most of them work. There's still been one, two, three, four, five that didn't. And so when I look at this, can I get this to work? Hello? Oh, there it is, right there. That one red one, right there. Who is that? You go over here, and it is Muri. It's the one I told you about. <laughs> so that's the one that the NIH picked out to give us an idea of what's going on with vitamin D. And look what an outlier it is. If you look at these other two, right below or above that is Ristogi and Casteo. They are, if I can, I may not use this anymore. I can't find it. Oh, there it is. This is Ristogi here and Castillo. These are here. And so I give you that because whenever someone disagrees with me, they accuse me of cherry picking. You're cherry picking your data. All right, so here's, as best I can do, give you an overall picture of all of it on vitamin D. So should you be uh, checking your vitamin D? Yes. And then this is looking at what it does. All studies showed improvement. Mortality, 38% reduction. Ventilation, 36%. ICU admission, 52%. That just shows you what it does. All right, very quickly, vitamin C. How are we on vitamin C? This study shows that 64%, 64.2% had low values of vitamin C. 17% had undetectable levels of vitamin C. That's not unusual when you have a cold. If you have a cold, you have a flu, your body, it saps your body of vitamin C right away. The one time you should take really high levels of vitamin C is if you have a cold or a flu. I experiment on this body. You say, you don't look like you're, uh, but I am. I am 67, and, and I've been beating this body up now for years. So one time when I was sick, I had a cold or a flu or something, and, and I took vitamin C, 5,000 milligrams, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60. I took 60,000 international units. Nothing happened. I went to bed, and I woke up feeling great. And I thought, ah, my body absorbed all that it needed. The next morning, I took 5, 10, and I start pooping everywhere. <laughs> that is, <laughs> diarrhea is the signal you have too much vitamin C because it just poops it out. It won't take it. And so isn't that amazing that in that one instance when I was really, really sick, I could take all this vitamin C because it's doing all this stuff as an antioxidant. The next day, I didn't need it anymore. And I just tried to try it, and, and that was, yeah, OK. And so here is high dose of vitamin C with COVID-19. This is looking at six uh, grams twice a day on the first day, and then six grams for the following four days. 
and it just shows this is with survival by severe critical disease. These are people who are on death's door. Does it make a difference? The red line up there shows after 7, 14, 21, 28. Uh, it's almost, say, 90% survived. And then on the standard therapy, it's 50%. And so um, is it important for vitamin C? Yes. So I just want to show you this again. Uh, look at the consistency with all this. They're all green and positive, except for this, cases. Vitamin C did not reduce cases in general. Well, that makes sense, because vitamin C doesn't go out there and attack things before it attacks you. It has to attack you first and then your body can defend against it. So uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do real well as far as preventing. And then here, here's the prophylaxis. Again, it didn't look like it did much in preventing it, but once they got it, it was very beneficial. All right, and I, uh, what time am I done? Five minutes? 35? Okay, so just a couple of slides on zinc. This just shows zinc levels of um, 100 to 120 and optimal is 90 to 150. So this is optimal, and they didn't end up in the ICU. Here's the ICU admissions. They were down a little bit below 100, and deaths were a little bit below that. And those are all significantly different between the groups. And so is zinc important? It really is. And we'll show you a little bit more about that later. But here is that same chart. You can look at it. Yeah, there's always contradictory data. This is nutrition science. It happens. I don't know that you would find many studies that, or meta-analysis that show that they all work. Everything just works. And so this is fairly consistent. And what it did, it showed a, on average a 25% improvement. And each one of these, this is c19zinc.com. You can go there when you get home, when you get in office. Or no, wait till you get home. And then uh, you can also put in there C19 vitamin D, or C19, put any drug you want in there. You can go look at it. You can compare ivermectin to uh, remdesivir. And you can look at what remdesivir did, not so good. And ivermectin, what it did, pretty good. So you can just look at the pictures of it. So um, that meta-analysis, C19, and then the name of the drug, the name of the nutrient, whatever, after it, gives you that. The last thing is quercetin. I've given you data. I'm going to give you no data on quercetin. I'm going to show you a mechanism for the first time. And uh, so this study just came out. This is your cell right here. And there's quercetin. It's the most fascinating chemical. I've studied it now for three decades. And it's amazing. It comes in all kinds of things. I'll end with that in just a minute. And then zinc acts as a iodophore. It actually, um, quercetin acts as an iodophore to get zinc into the cell. And what does zinc do? Zinc works directly, hampers the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It can't multiply. It can't produce. So it does that. And then over here, it targets ACE2 expression. So quercetin tends to lower the expression of ACE2. Angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is the way that COVID gets into our cells. And uh, on the top, it inhibits the attachment of the spike protein with ACE2. So it inhibits the spike protein on the coronavirus to attach to the ACE2 to get into the cell. So it does a couple of things there. And then down here, uh, again, quercetin is also working down here, uh, hampering the proteolytic cleavage of this enzyme so it doesn't function very well. So quercetin does amazing things. This, uh, this, uh, this is amazing. You should be eating quercetin every day, regardless of COVID or not, because quercetin works. This is the cascade of, of building clots and, and platelet aggregation. So it stops the actual... Uh, aggregation of the platelet. It stops in the promotion and creation of the, of the platelet, uh, of the uh, platelet aggregation. And so it's, it pr prevents thrombin and here fibrinogen to the fibrin clot. It hampers the clot. This is an amazing thing. If you have white toast for breakfast and, and bacon and, and you have a milkshake and hamburger with white bread for lunch and a piece of lettuce on it, and then for dinner you have a wonderful meal of 10 ounces of steak three leaves of lettuce, and two green beans. Uh, you don't get this. This comes in fruits and vegetables. And um, th they know this down to the place where it, these two amino acids in, there's only one protein that's really involved in the coronavirus. This is it. It's a very simple little molecule. And uh, th we, they know the attachment, so they can see where quercetin actually attaches to these two amino acids in the chymotrypsin-like protease that's in uh, the coronavirus. And so we know exactly where it connects. 
to block the replicate, to block the function of this protease. So it's quite amazing how much we know. We've known a lot about coronaviruses because we, ah, we sneeze them out all the time. And, and they've been around for a long time. And so this study just shows when you had uh, quercetin in the green, and this is looking at O2 saturation. This is the uh, control here. It went up uh, one day for seven. It went up with the quercetin group. It went up more because down here at 90, 88 is a problem. You know, 90 is not so good either. And you want to be up here at 95, 93, and the quercetin actually helped with that too. So this is just a study you can see. Compared to the other ones, look at this one. There's one study here that was a contrary study. And I'll point this out just for, for your enjoyment, is that in the, in the in treatment group, there was one person that actually got COVID out of 49. In the control, there was six out of 380. Because the sizes of the groups were different, it made this look like a negative effect. Okay. That whole thing is based on one person. So besides that one person, I don't know who they are or what they did or why they did it, but forget that one person. It's pretty much very, very positive for quercetin and what it does. And so we'll end with this. Here's where you get it. Eat fruits and vegetables. It's in there all. It's, I think it's the number one flavonoid compound that's out there. If it's not number one, it's right up there in the top. And you can see the things you get it. Do you realize that Americans, the average American, maybe your children, are out there eating all day long, the hamburgers and the hot dogs and the cereal for breakfast with the milk, and, and then for dinner they, they have a sandwich. They're not getting, you can go through a whole day and not get one of those things pretty easily in the United States. And so my suggestion is we eat more of this. Can you get an efficacious dose of quercetin just by eating fruits and vegetables? Yes, if you eat enough of them. Uh, you can't just have one fruit a day. Uh, you have to be a really fruit eater. I was in a talk two days ago with this guy who was a fruitarian. He ate nothing but fruit. Really? How long? 22 years. <laughs> wow. 22 years. God made this body amazing that you can be brutal to it and only give it 12 foods your whole life, and it'll survive on them if they're really foods. You know, you can't do that with a piece of white bread or a cracker. But with whole foods, you can. And so these are the things you want to aim for um, as far as a prescription for quercetin. So, you know, vitamin D is efficacious. It's amazing. Um, everybody needs to test for it. We, in medicine, we over-test things. Doctors order too many tests. Eh, they're not needed. Well, this is the one thing I think we ought to over-test on at the moment because it seems to be so critical. Uh, the range is 40 to 60 is what you're after. Vitamin C is efficacious for restoring this balance, uh, this redox balance when it's dealing with all of these uh, free radicals. Zinc is effective at reducing viral replication, and quercetin is effective at inhibiting viral replication and to keep your blood from clumping. Okay, <laughs> I went over by one minute. That's out I have, thanks. <laughs>